speaking of common value first price auctions. Here we go. So the setting is pretty much the same as we just had. We still have one item uh, for sale, but now this item has some fundamental value V. That's common for all bidders. Hence the name, as you could guess. We still have N bidders. None of them know this V for sure. But everyone gets some informative private signal. XI. So XI is not is now not the exact valuation, but it is the signal of V, which is noisy with uh, zero noise for simplicity. Meaning that XI is more or less your unbiased estimate of V. And as before, just for convenience, let's suppose that these signals are bounded and they can take values between 0 and some x bar. So just as we had before. Now the format is still first price, winner pay. So everyone simultaneously submits their bids. So it's sealed bid, like before. Highest bid wins, pays their bid, the I, and the rest pay nothing. So the expected profit is almost like before, except now uh, instead of XI we have V as the value of the item if you win it. So you switch valuation XI to this expectation. You do not know the, exactly what is the value of the item you're getting, but you can form your expectation. Firstly, you have your own private signal XI, on which you can make, on which you can build your inferences about V. But you, it, this is not, not the only piece of information that you can use. In particular, the fact that you that you have won, that your bid BI is above everyone else's bid is another relevant piece of information. And all of you know how this phenomenon is called. This is winner's curse. So the fact that you have won does by definition mean that you have bid higher than everyone else. But if we now think that your bidding strategy is monotone in signal X, and it's the same for everyone, so the higher your private signal is, the higher you bid. If this is the case, then the fact that you have won means that you had the highest signal among all other players. So you get the high signal, you think, wow, that's a really good item for sale. I'll buy it. You buy it, and you realize that, well, probably you got to buy it because everyone else thought that it was crap. And this would lead you to revise your valuation downwards. So the fact that you have won is bad news for you about the asset value. And this is pretty much where the winner's curse comes from. So this e expectation of your value conditional on XI and the winning will be lower than the expectation of the fundamental V conditional on your private signal alone. So this is the main thing about the common value auction the main thing that we will have. But we can proceed to solve it in pretty much the same way that we just had. So let us suppose that all other agents, let us fix some agent i, and let us suppose that all other agents follow some symmetric bidding strategy beta of x. So we will fix some beta, again it's increasing and differentiable, excuse me, for technical purposes. And once again we have this object y, y1 which is the highest signal among your competitors. So now, again, it is not the uh, valuation, the highest valuation among your competitors, but the highest signal among your competitors. So you can compute how much you value the asset, we'll call it this V of Xi, conditional on you having signal X and the best competitor having signal Y. And all other competitors having signals lower than Y. So you can compute this valuation, but you also need to 
keep in mind how much would this best competitor be willing to pay in order to drive uh, the equilibrium. So we will still have these uh, G's to be the distributions of Y1. And now, however, your private information will tell you, will be informative about the distribution of other signals. If you have received a high signal, it is likely that everyone else has also received a high signal. And vice versa, if you got a low signal, it, it's more likely that everyone else has received a low signal. So these distributions G, big G and small g, will now be conditional on the private signal that you have received, the small x. Okay, so let's suppose that player I has some signal, and now we will uh, just do the same thing but slightly differently. So instead of choosing bid bi, let's say that player i chooses whom to mimic. So he chooses type z, and he will bid in the same way as uh, the person with the private signal z would bid according to beta. So again, this is a slightly more convoluted way of saying the same thing, uh, of doing the same thing that we did uh, in private value case. I'm not sure why, why the textbook does it in two different ways. So if we, if we do it this way, if we say that player i chooses not the bid, but they choose z, whom they want to mimic, then player i will win whenever this z is higher than y1. Whenever the bid of player i is above uh, the bid that type y1 would bid. That the highest, that the strongest opponent, the most optimistic opponent would bid. And then, as usual, in equilibrium, we will be trying to find such beta that uh, z is equal to x. So it's, optim it's optimal for every type to bid as is prescribed to them by the equilibrium strategy. So they do not want to mimic some other type z, but they want to bid their beta of x. But if we pose the problem this way, so in terms of choice of z, then the expected profit from bidding like type z when your own private signal is x can be written as follows. So you take the expectation over all possible values of y that are lower than your chosen target z. And you take the expectation of the value of the asset that you will receive. And now the, this uh, signal of the strongest competitor, y, will matter for the valuation, right? You will want to know by how much you won. Because this will tell you, um, you know, how good the asset actually is. And then you will pay your bid beta of z, which is independent of y, so we can take it out of the integral, out of the expectation. And so we will have with we will be left with this expression for the expected profits. And you can work with this. So now you take this expression and you maximize it with respect to z. So z enters in three terms. And you take first order condition, so you take first derivative of this of this expression with respect to z. Now, if you remember your calculus, you will know how to take the derivative of this, respect, uh, of this expression with respect to this z. I can't remember the name of the rule, I, I just keep forgetting it. Is it Cauchy rule? No, I won't even try to remember. But if you do that, and if you don't remember the name or the rule itself, you go to the textbook once again. Uh, you will get this expression. So this is your first order condition for z. This condition gives you the optimal z, the optimal type to mimic, 
given once again your actual signal x and the bidding strategy of everyone else, the beta. Once again, at this point, we plug in our equilibrium condition. In equilibrium, it should be that z is equal to x, so it should be e optimal for you to bid as is prescribed by beta x for your own type. It should not be optimal to mimic anyone else. So if you plug that into the first order condition, you will end up with this nice and cozy differential equation yet again. And now you will need to solve this. You see that it looks pretty much similar uh, to what we had before, except now we have this more complicated valuation instead of just x. And the distribution functions will also be a little more complicated. But you can still solve this differential equation with the same boundary condition that type with the lowest signal, just bit 0. So you solve that differential equation, and if you do that with your dark magic, you will obtain this expression. Uh, so it will be the expectation, once again, of this V of YY, which is kind of the valuation that a person with signal I would have. And you take this expectation with respect to the newly constructed measure L, which is constructed as follows, uh, but I do not, I cannot give you any insight for what this L is and why it's constructed this way. So let's focus on this V. If you remember, let me leave this box, a very deformed box. In private value first price auction, your beta of x was equal to, I realize that you cannot probably see what I'm typing, but it might be a little larger once I finish. Uh, the optimal bidding strategy was equal to the expectation, yeah, that's better. Oh, I could have done it this way from the start. Your optimal bidding strategy beta of x in the private value case was equal to the expected value of the valuation of the strongest competitor conditional on them being weaker than you. So I want to claim that this parallels the, exp the expression that we had. Except now, now you are taking this expectation over not the y here, but this v. And it is not in any way intuitive why this v is the right object to plug in. I have some example here, but I will not go through it because it's not particularly illustrative of anything. So you are integrating over this value v of yy, and it's not obvious why this uh, why this is the right one to 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 take as the valuation of the bidder with private signal y. So what we will do is we will look at second price auctions to argue that this is that this is the right one to do. But before that, uh, let's just muse a little bit more at this uh, bidding strategy expression. And what I want to claim here is that there is still bid shading, even though you cannot really see it from here. So one is the same as in the private value case. So you are still taking the same kind of expectation over the valuations for the asset of the types that you have won over, that you have won against. You still want to make your bid low enough to not pay much, but high enough to win with decent probability. And it is still done via the means of similar expectation. But now you have another source of bid shading, and that is due to the winner's curse, as we discussed in the very beginning. So this winner's curse is actually captured by this v. 
In particular, this V, if you remember the definition of our V, it already conditions on the fact that all other signals of all traders who did not win and were, did not have the highest signal, that they had signals below Y. So what you have here is the um, you're taking expectation over these v of y of y, which are smaller than if you took your own signal into account. So these valuations ignore your own information about the fundamental value of the asset; they ignore x's, and these are in turn even lower than uh, the expectation of the fundamental value of the asset that you would have had conditional on your own private signal only. So this is the winner's curse. You take expectation over the valuations which are far below your, um, your valuation itself. I realize it was probably not clear. Sorry for that. I don't think I can muster any better at the moment. So let us now look at second price auctions. And that will maybe clarify a little bit for why this V of YY is the right thing to consider as player, as uh, the valuation of a player with signal Y. So the settings in second price auctions uh, are similar to the two that we have just considered. So we looked at private and common value first price auctions. Now let's say we have the very same uh, thing, but the winner pays the second highest price. The second highest bid, they should say. So the winner does not pay however, however much they bid, but they pay the highest losing bid. The expressions for expected profit will be more or less the same. Expect the payment except the payment will be different. So we had BI here. This is expected profit for the private value second price auction. You get the item that's worth XI. You pay the highest losing bid and you win the auction with this probability that your bid is higher than all other bids. In common value setting, once again, the same thing. You get the asset that's worth V, but you don't know V you take the expectation of V conditional on your own private signal and on the fact that you have won. And you pay the highest losing bid. Actually, now that I think of it, you should have an expectation here too. Because you do not know the highest losing bid, right? Okay, so how is it? How does it differ? How is it? How does it differ from the first price auction? When I started talking uh, about the first price auction, especially in private value setting, I told you that this is one of the, the simplest models of auctions. So the only model that's simpler than that is that of the second price auction with the private values. Because there you have this result, which says that in private value second price auction, it is a weakly dominant strategy to bid your own valuation. So weakly dominant means that it's a really, really kind of a strong result, robust result. And that's part of the reason why everyone likes second price auctions. So why is this so? Why is it optimal to bid your private valuation? Let's do a very quick graphical proof of that. So let's say that this axis is the scope of your possible uh, valuations from zero to x bar. And suppose that you have some valuation x in here. Let us proceed by contradiction and see how much do you gain or lose when you bid not your true x, but say something above. So when you bid this b prime above your valuation, for example. 
Now this outcome will of course depend on how everyone else bids. So let the purple, or the pink I guess, no pink is too close to red, let's take the blue. Blue everything, this is blue dot, legend, will denote the max bj, so the highest losing bid. And we'll consider cases based on where in this interval from 0 to x bar this highest losing bid is. Obviously is if this highest losing bid is a anywhere below x, then nothing really changes whether you bid x or b prime, right? Because you win in either case and you pay this highest losing bid here. So nothing changes for you um, whether you bid x or b prime. Now if highest losing bid or highest opponent's bid is above b, b prime, then again nothing changes because you lose either way and you get zero. So something changes only when the highest opponent's bid is between x and b prime. So let's consider that case. Let's suppose that bj is here. Or max of bj's. If you bid x, you lose against this bid, so you get zero. If you bid b prime, then you get to win. You get the asset that is worth x and you pay bj. So you win the auction, but your payoff is negative, because x minus bj is negative, because bj is higher than x. Which means that you probably do not want to win this auction, right? So bidding strictly above x is worse, if there is a positive probability that someone bids in this interval. It is strictly worse, so you do not want to do that. You can use the similar argument to show that it is uh, in the same way strictly suboptimal to bid below x, some b prime, because once again, if the highest opponent's bid is below b double prime or above x, not, then nothing changes from this uh, ch change of bidding. But bidding b double prime will be strictly worse if the highest opponent's bid is between the two. Because by bidding b to b double prime, you would lose. While if you bid x, you would win against this bid. You would get x, you would pay this bj. So you would get positive expected profit. In the end, you see that strategy of bidding x is indeed at least weakly better than any other strategy than any other bid in this scenario. You know, I sometimes look at my graphs in here and I, I just admire their monstrosity. Three-year-old child could draw it better. But the, the, the takeaway here is not that my drawings are horrible, but that bidding, the, bidding your own valuation is a weakly dominant strategy in private value second price auction. And this result is pretty extendable to, um, to vary in some other assumptions, as long as you stick in the second price auction framework. So now let us take a stretch of imagination and assume that it holds in the common value example that we have. And then we will take whatever you bid in that common value second price auction as your valuation. We will say that this is how much you value the asset. And as you can guess, this will be exactly this V of X and X. This will be symmetric one. You will not take the expectation conditional on others getting signal worse than you, or just some other expectation over other signals. You will bid you will assume that other signals are exactly equal 
to your own signal x, which is not intuitive. So let us probably try to see why it is the case, why this constitutes a symmetric equilibrium. Now, note that it will no longer be a dominant strategy to beat this, but it will still be an equilibrium. So let's go here and just try to do a quick argument. In private value second price auction, when you win, you pay the second highest bid, let's call it B2, and get the asset worth that's worth your Xi to you. So you want to win whenever you have to pay less than what you get. And you want to lose against bits that are above your value valuation. So it's optimal to bid At exactly your valuation because this attains kind of this optimum right you will win whenever someone bids lower than your valuation you will lose whenever some someone bids above your valuation so let's try to do the similar reasoning for the common value auction so in common value second price auction when you win you still pay this beta b2 let us frame this in terms of the equilibrium strategy you get the beta, you, uh, sorry, you pay the bid submitted by the competitor with the highest signal. And you get the asset that is worth, in that case, exactly V of X and Y1. So whenever the strongest of your opponents has signal Y1, this is your expectation of the asset value, conditional on that fact, and conditional on everyone else having signals even lower than that. So what this means is you want to win against beta of Y if V of XY is greater than beta y and you want to lose against this bit of the opponent if v of x y is smaller than beta of y so if all of the opponents Uh, use bidding strategy beta of y equal to v y y then this will be exactly the equilibrium bidding b of x equal to v of x x will attain the desired result. So bidding in this way, if your opponent has um, yes, basically if you have um, if x is greater than y Right? If your signal is greater than the greatest signal of the opponent, then you're supposed to win. But you only want to win, so you're supposed to win in the equilibrium, because in the equilibrium you want the strategies to be monotone. But you don't care what you're supposed to do in equilibrium, right? Be you want to do what's best for you. And what's best for you is to win whenever this condition holds. And it will hold when you bid according to this strategy. 
because when beta y is equal to v of y y, this thing is equal to v of y y, and so this inequality holds whenever x is greater than y. Vice versa, the same thing happens here. So the idea here is not that you actually value the asset at this amount, at this v of xx. It's not exactly the truth, the truth here. But if everyone uses this bidding strategy, then what everyone is supposed to do in equilibrium coincides with what everyone wants to do optimally, which is something that should happen in equilibrium. So this is the equilibrium strategy. So it is at this point that we use our imagination and say, well, you know, this is actually how much you should value the asset when you, uh, when you have private signal X. And so all of this was to say that in the common value first price auction, this V of YY is the relevant thing to, to look at, to integrate over, to assume as valuation of agent Y, which you want to take this, the expectation over. If you want to do the analog of B of x equal to expectation of y condition on y less than x. Again, not a very convincing intuition, right? A very, very many leaps of fate. And it's probably not super really important for our purposes. But uh, so the main idea that I want you to take away from this common value auctions is that bids are shaded in equilibrium. So everyone bids below their valuation, below their, below the amount that they value, that they would value the asset at based on their private signals alone. Everyone is bidding below that for two reasons. Once, one is that they shade their bid just like in the private value example, in the private value case because they want to get positive profit. The second reason is that there is a winner's curse. So winning the auction is bad news for you regarding asset value, so you want to bid less. And this is the main takeaway of um, the common value first price auction. So if you did not follow the past 15 minutes too closely, I don't blame you. Just take this home with you that bit shading happens to due to two reasons okay with that and with the perfect timing on the clock we move on to the last topic for today which is double auctions until now we have looked at cases where there is one seller who just auctions an item but this is not how it goes in the real world markets, right? In financial markets. Because there you have the bidders who are submitting um, buy orders. And there are sellers who are submitting sell orders. And there is competition on both sides. So let us try to look at how double auction would proceed. Could look like. So what does this two-sidedness add to our world? And in doing so, uh, we will follow this old paper by Chatterjee and Samuelson, so this is not in Krishna's book. And we will abstract from competition on either side. So we will assume that we have two agents, one seller and one buyer. And they are kind of competing with one another. But the buyer is not competing with other buyers, the seller is not competing with other sellers. Obviously you can add that too, but this will not change much. So we have these two agents, we still have one item for sale. We go back to private value setting for simplicity. So we will suppose that both have private valuations for the asset. Once again, they are xi between 0 and, and x bar. And these are independent, because you've seen how much pain and suffering and unintuitiveness common value setting brings us. And we're working in this um, 
same sealed bit example, so everyone submits their bit simultaneously without seeing what the other uh, player submitted. And whenever the buyer buyer's bid is higher than the seller's bid, so there is scope for trade, right? I want to buy and I'm willing to give you more than you want to receive for the asset. Then the trade happens. And let's say, for example, that trade happens at price BB, at the buyer's bid. In principle, you can have any price here between uh, BB and BS. Any such price would be acceptable for both players because they would both get a price improvement. Uh, so, but let us look at one particular setting because it uh, gives for a nice intuition. So what are the expected profits in this setting? They are the same as in first price uh, auction example for the buyer especially. So the buyer gets an asset that's worth XB for him. He pays BB own bid and this happens with probability that beta B is greater than beta S. For the seller the environment is the same except the sign is flipped. So he receives the bid, he receives the payment and this is BB not BS. So this is not his bid but it is the buyer's bid. And he parts with the asset that is worth XS for him and once again this trade happens if and only if buyer's bid is greater than the seller's bid. It might not be obvious at this point but we have seen we can rephrase this problem in terms of what we had earlier today. In particular, if we look at the seller, it is exactly the same as a private value second price auction. The sign is different, so it will be like a second price procurement auction, second price auction to sell, in which one buyer and it has many sellers and sellers are submitting bids, and the lowest bid wins and pay pays the second lowest bid. So the sign is different, but it is the second price auction, right? Because the seller quote unquote wins, meaning that the trade happens, if I realize that the inequality is strict here and weak here. Let's deal with the weak. So the seller wins if quotes the lowest price, the lowest bid of the two. And the price he receives, the payment he receives, is the second lowest bid, which in this example is exactly the buyer's bid. So for the seller, it is like a second price procurement auction. And for the same reason that we just had, you can see that it is weakly dominant for the seller to bid his true valuation for the asset. Now what about the buyer? For the buyer this setting is exactly the same as in the private value first price auction. So the buyer does not care that he's competing against the seller and not against other buyers because the environment is pretty much the same. Once again the buyer wins quote unquote. If the buyer has the highest bid of the two, and the buyer gets the asset and pays his own bid. So this is exactly like the first price auction. So the buyer will behave like in the first price auction, and uh, he's. You can derive the buyer's optimal strategy the same way as you did in the first price auction. So. If we take a particular simple example, again, uh, these private valuations are IAD uniformly on 0, 1. Then you can derive the buyer's uh, bidding strategy to be this n minus 1 over n times xb. It was uh, in the private value first price auction. Here n is equal to 2, you have two agents total. So the bidding strategy of the buyer will just be xb over 2. So in the end, in our simple example, the seller will bid the, uh, his valuation truthfully, 
the buyer will shade the bid and bid lower. So you see, double auction can be represented very, very directly in terms of these one-sided auctions, but there is one important distinction. The outcome of this double auction is inefficient. So if you go back to one-sided auctions, we mentioned that the outcome there is efficient. Whoever values the item the most gets it, is the one who receives the item. But in this double auction, uh, you kind of want to want the trade to happen whenever it is optimal, right? So you want the you still want the item to go to the person who values it the most, meaning that if the seller values it more than the buyer, if XS is greater than XB, then you want the item to stay with the seller. If it's the opposite, so if XB is greater than XS, if buyer values it more than the seller, then you want the trade to happen and you want the item to go to uh, the buyer. But from the strategies that we just derived, we see that this is not the case. Since the buyer shades his bid, the trade only happens under this weaker condition. So when the difference between XB and XS is large enough, while if the buyer values the item more than the seller but by a little bit, the trade will not happen. And this is the inefficient outcome. Now, a fun result for this setting is uh, Meyerson Satterthwaite theorem, also all the way back from the 80s, which says that if you look at this problem with one buyer and one seller and they have independent private valuations, there is actually no trading protocol that yields the efficient outcome. So if you want to get this efficient trade and you can choose different payment rules depending on players' bids, you cannot find such a payment rule which would implement this efficient trade unless you want to run a deficit. So unless you have a third party which is willing to pay for the efficient trade to happen. So this is the one distinction that I wanted to make. And with that, we will round up. We will sum up. So the takeaways from today. We, I presented to you the, uh, the general framework for auction models, arguing that this is something that is relevant for financial markets, even though it is probably not something necessarily always explored within the context of financial markets. If you'd like to know more, I believe the department has a course, a whole course devoted to auctions that runs in fall. I have no idea what's happening in there, but I presume that they actually look at some of the auction models in more detail and at some of the empirical evidence. If you're more interested in this latter type of results, like Meyerson's Satterthwaite theorem, and you want to see, you know, what is the best thing to do, maybe going beyond auctions, what is the best protocol for this or other setting, then you should try taking mechanism design in full. But sticking with auctions, I, uh, so I showed you this general framework relevant to financial markets, not always considered as a part of the financial market, uh, as a few. And we looked at a few of the simplest models just to illustrate what is the kind of the scope of things you can expect to see in these models. And uh, the most relevant for us would probably be the common value first price auction. And in that, as I recently argued, you have two sources of bid shading. Market power, as you can call it, which arises from there being a limited number of buyers, which means that I can pay a little less than, I'm, than I would absolutely be willing to, just because I can get away with it. Just because there is some probability that I can get away with it. So this is one source of bid shading, and another source of bid shading is, of course, the winner's curse, which we know and love, and which we commonly call adverse selection. These two are pretty much the same thing. The winner's curse is probably a little narrower in scope. Another takeaway is that the second price auction, as a format, is a very simple and robust 
and pretty cool and we should see more of those in the real world and uh, if you remember what I talked about at the very beginning these search engine ad auctions do actually run as a second price auctions I believe I'm not sure about spectrum auctions I think this is also true there but I'm not 100% sure depends on the country and the particular auction Finally, one last fun takeaway is that the efficient outcome is kind of difficult to obtain in bilateral trade setting. So if you want the efficient trade in markets with uh, asymmetric information, it's something that is difficult to get. And we've seen some examples earlier in the course in which you had efficient trade. In this example, you do not have efficient trade. So it all depends on what assumptions you're willing to make on, the, uh, on your model, what assumptions you are making. So that would be it for today. Thank you for hanging around for this, again, op optional lecture. What we'll do next week is, as I've told you, we will be doing a roundup of the course. We'll do, uh, we, will, we will briefly go through everything that we have seen in the past few months. And we'll talk a little bit about what will happen on the exam. I will probably use a slightly different format for that last lecture. So I assume that there will be, that there might be more questions. So we will use it in a more standard way with one of those conference calls. Zoom or whatever else will be available. But I will probably still stream it out here on Twitch. So I, I will make an announcement on Epson with the, with the details on that. As usual, I will hang around for a couple of minutes if there are more questions about today, but otherwise, thank you, goodbye, and I will see you next week.